Okay, let's go. <laughs> um, well, thanks uh, for this great opportunity. And I think it has been a great conference so far. And I'm honored to be with so many experts in La Ruelle. Well, I have to confess that before this conference, I never read a single word of La Ruelle. But I also have the privilege to be one of the last speakers here. Um, so I can try to get some pieces together of what has been said so far, especially in Rocco's talk uh, from yesterday. I'm going to present my work in progress, The Place of Global Thought, which involves a critical reading of Deleuze and Guattari in light of Nishida's concept of Basho. And when I say the concept of Basho, it is already imprecise, and we will shortly see why. Our contemporary Western thought finds itself at a fundamental impasse, which I call the impasse of the transcendental. Either it, it aligns itself to its post Kantian heritage, so called correlationism, or it blindly reasserts a pre structured world of objects in themselves, that is, triple O or speculative realism, what they find somewhat naive. In either case, the impulse of the transcendental is not truly overcome, once affirmed, once entirely neglected. Much more interesting would be a neither nor approach, a neti neti, or perhaps even better, both and. At the limits of thoughts, in my view, there's always some kind of dialectics involved. Um, what I think uh, doesn't necessarily have to lead to a Hegelian aufhebung or a sublation. Actually, I wrote my master's thesis on Hegel and Deleuze um, and employed a method which I call differential dialectics. And as you will see also, Nishida has a very different understanding of the dialectic to, to Hegel. Now, one way of dealing with this aporia is to reconsider our terminology of concepts. The idea, in short, is to draw our attention to the genitive, the concept of, which is widely overlooked, I think. Even in philosophical discourse, we tend to say, you know, Deleuze's concept of difference, or Heidegger's concept of being, or Hegel's concept of the concept. But that's already the joke in Hegel, uh, because in Hegel, actually, it makes sense to talk about the concept of the concept because he was an idealist. So Hegel, I think, understood the problem and based his whole philosophy on it. But we're trying to do something else in Hegel, right? Um, the problem is that each time we actually double the concept so that it becomes a concept of a concept, a platonic idea. But if philosophy is supposed to matter in the literal sense, that this in terms of uh, new materialism, its concepts must relate to something other than a concept. And this doesn't mean um, that this other would be predetermined objects or things, actually to the contrary, go more in a Nishidan direction. Um, the impulse of the transcendental lies exactly in this lack of an absolute other that would be able to give place to the concept of philosophy. This counterpart of concepts I will call their place, which explains the title of my paper, The Place of Global Thought. And in the end of this talk, we should be able to make sense of all these genitives, the concept of the place of. In Deleuze and Guattari, we actually may find a similar approach of such a counterpart of concepts. Here, concepts are arranged on a so-called plane of immanence, which is supposedly not a concept, although I will call it a hyperconcept. The problem here is formulated in terms of a juxtaposition of modern European philosophy and ancient Greece. Now I quote, we today possess concepts, but the Greeks did not yet possess them. They possessed the plane, that we no longer possess, the Greeks and us, but who are us. 
this juxtaposition of past and present um, certainly aims at the philosophy of the future in which we would we would have both concepts and the plane not only the concepts um, today we have the concepts but what is actually this amazing plane of imminence that we no longer possess And this is, in fact, a tricky question um, because I had a look again in the in the actual description how Deleuze and Guattari describe the the plane of imminence in the book uh, What Is Philosophy? Um, because the description of the plane actually comes very close to what I understand as a place, or Nishida would understand as a place. Uh, they understand it as a as an absolute horizon um, or an all one. And in the footnote, they also refer to Lavuel, um, but I think it is unclear if they actually understand him. This is a very confusing question they ask for Lavuel. Um, now, Lavuel said yesterday that the one is not a plane. And this is actually the, the crux of my own critique, I think. I think the main problem in Deleuze and Guattari is actually that they understand the plane of imminence, not as chaos itself, but like a section of chaos and acts like a sieve. The image of the sieve immediately reminds me of the transcendental outline in Kant. Um, but if you have a look at ancient Greece, there, there are all these famous hyper concepts. And this you really can call hyper concepts, logos, being, nous, all these concepts which make uh, ancient Greece so famous as the, um, as the starting point of all philosophy, as it were. Um, and all these provide a ground for reasoning, but by excluding unreason. It's always a matter of exclusion. And that's why you can also call it kind of a sieve, a filter. So it is a categorical filter or sieve, a philosophical decision. Now, still in, uh, in the pre-Socratics, um, there can be found an alternative to this reductive plane of Logos uh, in the terms of chaos, even earlier in Hesiod, um, Aperon in Anex uh, Aneximander, and even la uh, later than in, in Plato, the term Horda. I'm using the modern Greek um, pronunciation here, Horda. This is rather a pre-philosophical or perhaps even non-philosophical place that dates back to Hesiod and was established in philosophy by this, uh, especially by Thales, who is sometimes also considered as the first philosopher um, and Anaximander. Um, while the method of these early thinkers is certainly philosophical, I argue that their subject matter, what they are talking about is actually still mythological. This is to say that the notion of water in Thales, similar as in the Babylonian and Numa Elish, is not actually a concept, but the absolute other of the concept on which concepts only start to cultivate. Also, Anaximander's Apiron is its natural progression, referring back to Hesiod's chaos or chaos, still devoid of philosophical inquiry. His concepts, on the other hand, are concerned with the binary differentiation of this amorphous basic element. So it's almost like a relation of non-philosophy to philosophy, a binary which comes in. Now, this alternative history of the pre-Socratic foundations of ancient Greek philosophy uh, maybe trace back until Plato's Timaeus with its discussion of horror or place 
and Hora is characterized as a Triton Genos or a third kind, which is neither phenomenon nor idea, but that stuff in which the phenomena keep changing. It is also an ultimate receptacle or recipient, the homenon, which receives in a way without receiving so that its properties are never its own. And uh, Derrida has written a great book on this, uh, but I think he totally misses the point when he identifies horror with difference. Because horror, after all, is also described as some undifferentiated molding stuff that is translated. In Greek, it is the schematizomenon, on which the ideas are stamped. There's always a stamp involved in Plato. Um, now, actually, the image of the stamp comes much closer to the image of the seed. It's always also kind of a filter. And I think Hora is by no means the thief, but actually the, the stuff itself, the one which goes to the thief, so to say. So I can summarize here as a short intermission on the and Gauterie. The plane of imminence is not the place of global thought for what we seek. Since it acts like a thief, it is already philosophical not non-philosophical. This marks the contemporary impasse of the transcendental. Now to conclude my critique of Deleuze and Guattari, let us also have a look at the notion of geophilosophy, which invokes some crucial questions uh, concerning a global philosophy of the future. Actually, there are the central question is, why did philosophy emerge in ancient Greece? And what is the relation of this question to the re-territorialization of philosophy in modern Britain, France, and Germany? Is philosophy always linked to these national identities or may it overcome them? And also, what is philosophy's relation to religion? Is it even possible to speak of a religious philosophy? Or is true philosophy only possible under the condition of a certain atheism, respectively, in all traditions? And here we, we, uh, we hear straightforward atheism, what I'd say um, goes, goes strictly against what we discussed also yesterday about Nishida. Um, that philosophy, in a way, has to start from, from religion. And this is, in a way, a given in the and Gautari. To be a philosopher, you have to be an atheist. Um, now I answer, even without applying the common censorship of post-colonial theory, we see that all these questions have the taste of a certain Eurocentric attitude, celebrating European philosophy in contrast to an Oriental wisdom or spirituality. This is really straightforward in, uh, in what is philosophy, um, the, the saints from the East and so on. Um, we may thus add uh, a great number of more thought-provoking questions. Did philosophy emerge in Greece at all? And did it not re-territorialize re as well in the Arabic Middle Ages, in modern India and Japan? Is the notion of atheism not actually limited to the Abrahamic religions and utterly affirmed in Buddhism? Also, the general neglection of the early pre-Socratics shows that so Thales and Anaximander shows that European philosophy in general is not much concerned about the notion of a place, which in Asian thought is actually a very central question. The geographical location at the crossroads between Europe and the Middle East is of course unique and reflected philosophically. But now let us come to Asia, first to India. 
And when it comes to Asia, the best example is certainly Nagarjuna, whose concept of Sunyata is not actually a concept, but I'd say Sunyata itself is a place. Now, emptiness is empty. It itself is empty, and nothing can be said about it. That's why I would say it goes on con uh, endlessly in, in Nagarjuna. You can always say emptiness is empty, and also this emptiness is empty again, and so on. So it's actually not a concept. Um, but how to still talk about it, he says, um, there are two kinds of truths. One is, um, one is ultimate and the other one um, conventional. And the ultimate truth in this sense is emptiness, which I call the plate. And the conventional truth is best described through dependent origination, which I call the concept. In China, for example, uh, Fazang's Golden Line is also a good example um, because also Plato's stimulus compares order with the base material of a sculpture whose shape is mere illusion. Also in Plato, I think uh, it's about gold. Um, but Fazang goes uh, even further than this because the lion is composed of an infinite number of lines which each refract each other. Quite similar to the monadology in Leibniz, actually, which then again will be developed further by Nishida. But now let us come to Nishida. In his, es uh, in his essay, Basho of 1926, Nishida writes, Following the words of Plato's Timios, I shall call the receptacle of the ideas in the sense Basho. Needless to say, I am not suggesting that what I call Basho is the same as Plato's space or receptacle space. Now, what is similar to Plato? Firstly, Basho itself is not a concept. It is the place of concepts the receptacle of the ideas, as Nishida writes. Secondly, it is not an entity itself, but the wherein of everything. It is a place. And thirdly, it is wholly undetermined. It has, like Plato's Gora, no properties, which would be its own properties. But Basho is, first of all, nothing, Mu, a term derived from Zen Buddhism. But as in Nagarjuna, this is no nihilism, rather sort of emptiness, especially in terms of absolute nothing in Nishida. Um, this also gets confirmed by Nish Nishida's notion of pure experience, which is a positive experience, actually, um, which is able to precede the transcendental field of Kant and goes beyond the common binaries. Now, Basho is undetermined like Hora, but it also forms itself. Not like in Plato, where Hora is totally passive and is being formed by the ideas. In a way, Basho is undetermined, I'd say, exactly because it determines itself through self negation. And this now, I thought about it yesterday, um, this seems to me an answer to Tanabe's criticism that we discussed yesterday, um, because it is a sort of emanation and at the same time a dialectic. What not many people know is that the major influence of Hegel was the German mystic Jakob Böhme, who is also frequently cited by Nishida. Um, in this terms, dialectics is not actually opposed to mysticism, but it's strictly a philosophical form. And finally, as we also discussed yesterday, Basho is both imminent and transcendent at once. And in a way, I agree with uh, Rocco that this is no coincidencia oppositorum. 
So transcendence and immanence are not identical in a strict sense. But in another sense, if you take all this Burma and Hegel reference, I also disagree because immanence is also the concrete expression of Basha in the world. Its transcendence is harmless because it is wholly undetermined unless it manifests itself. So you always have this relation of the unmanifested transcendence, which however doesn't have any content. And on the, on the other hand, you have the, the manifested, which is always already imminent. And I'd call this dialectics the, the radically imminent practice we were talking about yesterday, again in Roko's talk. Now, all this was about what I call Basho itself. Let's have a quick look into what I would call the concept of Basho, um, which I strictly separate from Basho. And this will explain, I think, a lot of what I just said. The concept of Basho, so not to confuse you anymore, the concept of Basho is indeed a concept, but the concept of its absolute other, Basho. Of course, the concept of Basho is the concept of its other, of Basho itself, right? Um, Nishida's concept of Basho is absolute self-contradictory identity. And this is seen especially in Nishida's late, later works. So I basically understand Nishida um, in this text starting from 1926 uh, with the essay Basho and as a, as a place and then relating it to, to his later works where we can talk about the the proper concept of this place, because the uh, Basho actually never disappears also in, in the text on, uh, on absolute self-contradictory identity. He always talks about the world, but also Basho appears again and again, and I think it's more underlying. It's not identical to the contradiction. Um, and taking the difference between the concept of Basho and Basho itself, Nishida's system may be understood as an anarchic hierarchy because everything will lead to contradiction and therefore refers back, it always refers back to its place. Um, if you have a look in the bottom left, absolute nothing gets relativized, but finally, collapses into contradiction. From the bottom right corner, the non-human interacts with society, society with the non-human, there's always this interaction. Um, society also interacts with the individual. Now the individual interacts with other individuals, but also with the whole, which Nishida calls inverse correspondence. And all this mutual interaction, which is based on um, mutual self-negation, um, eventually also will lead to contradiction. And in the upper right corner, to put it more abstractly, Basho determines itself as consciousness, which then initiates the dialectics. And this dialectics, again, um, leads to contradiction. And I think there are many ways to put this, and please correct me if you think I'm wrong somewhere. Just wanted to um, give you a bit of understanding where this, my thinking leads if I separate the, the Basho from, from the concept of Basho, right? Um, and in general, I'd say that Basho itself is not contradictory. It is indifferent like Nagarjuna's Sunyata, because it needs some human interaction actually to form actual opposites and contradictions. The very peak of this pyramid, the concept of Basho is contradiction itself. It is, I think, more like an event 
like the eternal now, as we see that what uh, Meister Eckhart, ewig and nu. Um, also, I'd say that Basho itself is not actually uh, transcendent and uh, transcendent this way, because trans is always uh, going um, above. Um, and in this understanding, it, it is rather below, so I, I'd call it um, subscendent. So now, um, let us see if he understood anything or if it was all for nothing. Mu. In Deleuze, the field of imminence is based on the concept of difference. But the concept of difference is a concept of a concept. It's always this, this doubling. Respectively, the plane of imminent is the place of European philosophy. To put it differently, it is a place, but not the absolute place, and is thus limited to the Western European territory. And with having learned so much about La well, we could add um, that it's about philosophy, not about non-philosophy. Now, how about Nishida? There should be a slight difference now in Nishida. The concept of Basho is the concept of its absolute other, and this is to say of the absolute other of the concept. This is why it, it matters, because it is related to the absolute outside of the transcendental realm. Accordingly, Basho itself is the place of global thought and not of European philosophy. It's also intentional to separate here philosophy from thought. I think it's thought is more, more general. Um, it is not a concept or plane, or also not a hyper concept, but a pre philosophical place. And exactly therefore, it embraces all concepts of philosophy, exactly because it's not philosophical, exactly because it's the unthought, it is the place of global thought. And we can even ask ourselves if the notion of the, the earth or of the territory uh, um, is actually the right footing for a philosophy of the future. The plane of imminence is ground. The place of global thought is absolute unground. Perhaps it is even planetary or universal in terms of, in the sense of the universe, right? Um, but now, on the basis of Nishida, we also might be able to reformulate the and Gautari in terms of an anarchic hierarchy, and this could also be second intention in the and Gautari. And as um, Jordanko said mm -hmm. yesterday, um, comparative philosophy is always also a matter of our creative interpretation. Let's see if you agree in this kind of term. Um, now, if difference is not the concept of a concept, difference is certainly the concept of chaos, which is a term much invoked, but not much developed by Deleuze, I think. Um, you may also think of chaos as the origin in mythology again, in all, in, in all mythology around the world you will find chaos as a sort of chaos as an origin. Um, and then chaos would be the place of global thought and difference is its concept. Now in Deleuze and Guattari, it's difference and not the negative. Also the term chaos, I think, uh, is actually more adequate than Nishida's notion of absolute nothing. It's absolute nothing I find quite confusing, especially if you put in relation to Nagarjuna's Sunyata. 
I also find the term chaos more adequate than Larwell's term one. Um, because chaos is not a something, but also not nothing. Neither one nor multiple, neti neti, neither nor, the unspeakable, unthinkable, all one, so to say. Well, thank you. And as we are now heading into the Q&A, I also have two questions for all of you. The first one is, um, does this reading of Nishida contradict with his notion of Basho as a predicate, with the predicate logic? Because chaos or place is this way indeed understood as a kind of uh, substance, but of course not in the sense of Aristotle or even triple O. Um, secondly, uh, does Laruel agree with this Nishiden overturning of the plane of imminence? Actually, after our encounter yesterday, I would actually say yes, but I'm still unsure about Laruel's notion of, of the transcendental, how much it is related to the, to the to imminence or to the plane of imminence. Okay, thank you. Shall I stop sharing? I can't hear you. My apologies. Uh, okay. Thank you, Hannes. Uh, that was a great uh, talk and quite novel approach here for us to all think about together. So we have about eight, nine minutes for Q&A. Um, I'll open the floor to the audience. Mm -hmm. I guess it was a quite chaotic talk, um, but I had in mind to to really have some time for for the Q and A and fill fill some gaps. Yes, Stanimir, let's go. We have, yeah, uh, Stanimir, go ahead, and I, I guess Rocco will, will go next. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just it's just a very general question um, regarding I'm. Uh, I'm just trying to make sense of the entire presentation with uh, the title of your presentation. I was just wondering when you uh, talk about place, uh, do you mean do you mean basho um, as a translation, or any species? The case, do you mean that basho is some kind of uh, super collider of global philosophical thought or quasi philosophical thought, whatever the word is, given the geo philosophies. Um, and yeah, various concatenations there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, of course. My main idea in using the term place is, of course, this, this um, similarity of terms in, in Plato, in the Horda, which is commonly trans also translated as place, like also Nishida's Basho is translated as place. And um, what makes my, my paper so tricky is that I'm doing something very similar to Deleuze and Guattari. I actually try to find the, a counterpart of the concept. Um, and it is so tricky because this counterpart in Deleuze and Guattari itself is called the plane of imminence and i find this this term plane of imminence already implying too much so i try to to replace this plane of this plane with, with the place and from there um you see i try to to go a step further than than Ishida and, and plato by really um, trying to employ the term place as a very, very um, general, maybe meta, uh, meta philosophical term to understand philosophy related to the, the place to the concept. Now, of course, this works very well um, then with the example of Nishida. 
I just have one scholastic uh, commentary, and that is very short. I just disagree that um, <clears throat> the word is place when it comes to Plato. I don't think that horror is uh, properly translated as place. Uh, I, 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 there, is, there is a space interpretation of horror, and I think it's uh, more probably translated as space, not as place. The place interpretation. Say, mm -hmm. uh, sorry? What I say. Space, space, yeah. The horror uh, interpretation as a place is extremely Aristotelian, and it's also a Deridian. Um, there is a Deridian inflection in the use of the term. Um, so, the, in terms of the comparability between horror and Basha, I think that it's quite problematic to use the place for both because horror is more like a space. But that's really a scholastic discussion that we don't have to have now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, Rucka, go ahead. Great. Yeah, Hannes, first, uh, thanks so much for your talk. I really, really appreciated it. Um, and I, I really uh, feel like I, I, I grasped something from the, the diagram that you had uh, had in the slides of, I think it was titled Anarchic Hierarchy or, or something, something to that effect. And the, yeah. um, it struck me uh the the very the very interesting dynamic in the diagram is to have basho at the exterior the kind of uh infinite limit exterior and then this there's so there's a vector of convergence or determination moving towards the center but then at the center is contradiction which produces a contrary vector back to Basho, right? And I, it, it seems to me that you could almost uh, conceive of that, that oval of contradiction in the center as being both uh, uh, a region, but also a point, right? That it, its contradictory nature is the fact that it is, it's a contraction of a topological region to a, 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 a uh, an absolute point, which is its contradictory nature, which in a sense shoots it back immediately to Basho. So that you, I, I think you, it captures really well the asymmetry of the, the mediation of determination and the, the immediation of absolutely contradictory identity. Um, and I wonder if that's, if that, asymmetrical difference is also captured in, in your use of the concept of chaos. And it seems to me that there's a, a, a similar ambiguity in the term chaos in that it, it usually in philosophical contexts has the connotation of indeterminacy. We think of chaos as being like the ocean with the, you know, the waves are indeterminate at any moment. Um, but it, mathematically, Chaos has more of the de of the sense of absolute determinacy. That a, 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 a dynamical system is chaotic if the most minute difference or perturbation produces unlimited effects. So you can think think of something that like a fractal, where the shape is so fully determinate that it is, it's over determinate. There's no, there's no room for the mediation of, um, of a kind of form, right? Uh, it's, 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 it's so fully determinate that it's, it becomes um, atomized. And, and I wonder if that, my, I guess my question to you is, do you think that, that that interpretation of chaos, thinking of chaos not as what is absolutely indeterminate, what is absolutely determinate does that is that part of part of your concept or are you are you thinking of the of chaos from the standpoint of indeterminacy i think i think you've got it already <laughs> um because it's both i'm thinking chaos in terms of radical indeterminacy but then again, if you if you have the, this pyramid, this uh, 
concentric circles in mind, for example. Um, here in the center would be exactly the dynamic system, which is characterized by being extremely determined and that's why extremely sensitive. So it is very it would be very similar to what Nishida then calls contradiction. So the the mathematical notion of chaos would be something I would call the the concept of chaos again, right? So the concept is always um, in a way the opposite of the of the thing itself. Chaos itself is wholly undetermined. Um, but the mathematical notion of, of chaos, um, if you think, yeah, of all well, fractals, Mandel's what's that, and so on, it's extremely, or the, the, the butterfly effect, it's extremely sensitive. And because it's so sensitive, um, there's a high possibility for collapse or for the, whatever to happen. And this is again something which directly relates the the extreme determination back to the indetermination, right? It's a, and this is uh, this is an event, as you said. The the point is really getting back to to an extremely dense point, the event which is um, unity of of time and and space, as in Nishida as well. Always the concept relating back to its place, basically. Yeah, thanks. I understand. Yeah, Rucker, go ahead. No, I just, yeah, I just wanted to, to yeah, say thanks for the, the response. Okay, uh, we're just uh, right uh, with the time here. Um, so, uh, if there's any quick comment or question, maybe, uh, but we really have to move on. So uh, does anyone want to jump in? There's one in the chat also. This is a question. Should I read it? Not so cool. um, since we don't really have uh, much time and this seemed like a lengthy uh, comment question. Thank you, one. Yeah. yeah, let's go on and uh, I'll answer the chat. Right? All right, so uh, thank you, Hannes, and they, thank, thanks to everyone who uh, uh, offered questions and comments. And uh, Hannes will be uh, answering Mabub uh, later on, probably uh, either in person, uh, if we have a chance to talk to each other or uh, during the round table. So let's make a note of this.